Stephen King, what a great pleasure to meet you online. Likewise, thank you for, for having me doing this. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been watching a few of your videos and uh, I was hoping we could uh, yeah, well, get into the broader perspectives and looking ahead to getting future ready with regards to the Sidegeist movement. Um, sure. Yeah. Could you maybe just quickly initially describe your own uh, background with it? Sure, I mean, I'm a, a citizen like everyone else, a concerned citizen about the, the state of the world and, you know, the problems that are uh, getting more and more clear around us. And uh, I was originally introduced to the first two films a few years back by a friend of mine. And I was completely unaware of, of the whole movement uh, as it stands today at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but very quickly got very interested because there were just some shall we say, things that clicked for me when I watched especially uh, Zeitgeist Addendum, which is the second film and uh, the first film that really spawned the movement, so to speak. So uh, I, was, I got really interested very, very quickly after watching those films and uh, I signed up at the international site and uh, at that point there weren't that many people involved, um, but I just thought this was very interesting and uh, and so I found the Danish site, and at that point there was about 50 people signed up in Denmark, so it was very, very <laughs> in its infancy at that point. Right. Uh, and very quickly I got involved with some people, and we started exchanging ideas and, and what is this all about, and so it just grew from there. So before I knew it, I was the uh, coordinator for Denmark, <laughs> and right. uh, yeah, and I've, I'm just taking a break from that right now, so at the moment I'm not that involved. Mm. Uh, because I've spent the past two years really literally thinking about little else and you have to be careful not to get too consumed <laughs> in stuff like this and just you know have perspective on things so I'm taking a little break right now right okay well, interesting to hear I mean I, and I agree with regard, regards to um, you know looking ahead to the future it, it has to be balanced with with living in the present mm -hmm. uh, so that I mean you can still relate to people who haven't yet had a chance to look at the, the things you have. Um, and I think that goes to, I mean, whichever path you, you look ahead through, I mean, it's, uh, it, you have to balance it. But, but so, so for, for two years running, you, you've been, would you, would you say, more or less the, the most active uh, proponent well, of Sidegeist here in Denmark? Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively small band of people still here in Denmark. I mean, there are some people in, in Aarhus and in Aalborg as well, but mm -hmm. they're really having a hard time getting organized because they're only like four or five people. Right. Um, and they still haven't got to that point where they really have someone that they could call a coordinator who has some takes on some responsibility. It's a little bit better in Copenhagen. We're about 15, 20 people here that meet regularly and on some level are active with one or another thing. Um, the, the problem with this whole movement is that it doesn't really have any structure. It's not like, you know, joining some, uh, some institution where you have clear-cut, uh, you know, positions and people are doing this and that. It's more of an information-based movement that really seeks to, uh, to facilitate the spreading of relevant information. So nobody's leading anything. Nobody's you know knocking you over the head if you don't do anything. So and people have seem to have a problem with taking on personal responsibility. I mean, if nobody tells them what to do, uh, they sort of drift uh, out the outskirts again. It's it's a strange ph phenomenon, really, and it's it, I think it tells a lot about our culture, really, that we we have a really hard time just being autonomous and and looking up information and sharing information on that level uh, without somebody tell us, telling us what to do. Uh, it's symptomatic really and it just goes to show that we, we, have, we have a long way to go in, in terms of culture um, because we're so used to these hierarchical structures that we've been living with for so long that even if people want to move away from them uh, they have actually a hard time doing so, and and we're all. I mean, if if you look at your own life, I think we can all see uh, structures like that where we we're more inclined to do something if somebody tells us to do it than just doing it by ourselves. Well, for uh, I would agree. For for most people, uh, yeah, uh, to one extent or another. Um, though uh, I think there's another uh, crucial factor at play, uh, <coughs> which makes it even more difficult for people to to get organized around anything. That's uh, something we, we call uh, information overload society, 
one would discuss as well. Quite simply that the, the level of complexity and the relatively open access to a lot of knowledge, um, even though if you, you, you talk about a crucial, uh, key, important knowledge uh, on a topic that interests you, there's still likely more information out there that you can process in a lifetime. Uh, and and since we live in these societies where we have all this access and all these uh, possibilities, we of the middle class, uh, to my mind it's also a crucial factor that, that it's, uh, it's just hard to get people to put time and energy into any one uh, area or any one movement um, because people are doing so many things. Sure, I mean I absolutely agree, there, there, there's totally information overload and the problem is, you know, sifting through all that information and finding out what's actually relevant because you have so many interest groups trying to get their message across and most of it's really nonsense and, uh, and has very little relevance to, to what it means to be alive in, in this wonderful world that we live in um, if you look at it from an empirical standpoint. And this is one of the uh, key things about the movement is trying to actually cut through all the uh, bullshit, if you will, and excuse my French, and try to find the, 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 the truly relevant information about where we are, how we got here, and how do we move on from here. Because so many different interest groups trying to steal our attention, and some of them are, are relevant, sure, but there's a lot of noise out there that steers us away, and a lot of it's culturally based as well. So, which makes it even more difficult because we have uh, strong relations with our culture naturally. Uh -huh. So it, it's it's really difficult to navigate in that. But that's one of the points of the movement is really to try and get people to to sift through all of the noise and and go to the really truly relevant information, which is really quite simple when you think about it. We we live on a finite planet and we have to find a way to uh, get some sort of dynamic equilibrium if we expect to be here. Uh, for, for the next, uh, well, I don't know, hundreds of years anyway, uh, because we're we're on a collision course with our way of life, and mm -hmm. if anyone who who doesn't see that is really wearing some kind of blindfold, yeah, or, or you know, ten foot blinkers at least, <laughs> um, and well, well, I have to agree with that, and I think anyone who would call themselves a concerned citizen. Uh, would share that perspective uh, to one degree or another. Uh, whatever you, you do with that, I mean, that's, I guess, the measure of your citizenship, right? Um, but, well, when it comes to sifting through the noise uh, and finding what's, what's relevant, um, well, in a society where we have freedom of speech, I mean, well, I guess we'd have to allow, uh, you know, freedom of, uh, you know, information consumption as well. Uh, even though we, we it's, you know, as a concerned citizen, often you disagree with people who spend all the time on the on entertainment of one sort or another, and then you know you want to shake them up and, and say, just have a look at this. I mean, uh, there's, <laughs> I mean, uh, have you seen just one documentary this year? Um, for one thing, uh, but but it's, uh, yeah, for me it's just it's a little bit uh, hard to get around to that ethically. I mean, to to, to sort of well, decide for other people what constitutes noise and what constitutes crucial information. Um, I mean, again, this may, may be too idealistic, but, but from my perspective, what would be most important to te teach people to do that for themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, nobody can decide for anyone what is relevant information in this day and age, of course, because we are all used to everyone has a right to their own opinion and you know can form their own opinion. Mm -hmm. But what I try to get people to do is I try to ask them how come you have this opinion? Where does that opinion come from? Yeah. Because you have to be willing to analyze why you think the way you do. There is a reason why you think you do and sometimes there's a complex uh, range of events that got you to that stage where you are now and sometimes it's really simple. Uh, and, but there are many things that we each and every was ho hold for granted that really aren't. It's a, it's a consequence of events. And once you start analyzing that and getting to the bottom of that, you realize that a lot of the things that you hold as being true or the way that you believe things or perceive the way things are has to do with your own environment and your own rearing and the things that 
happen to a less more or less degree happen to you if you will so that's the first step as I see it because I don't really care what you what you say unless you can back where you where you got it from you know if we if we can sift through all of the the so-called normative stuff you know all the stuff that justifies us having our right to our opinion and understanding what shapes our opinion where does that come from so that we better can find some common ground to start off from and you'll find that this is actually sometimes easier than you think but you have to start the process somewhere exactly. and getting people to even think about that I would say is the first step there we are in complete agreement I mean uh, and, and yeah so the way we, we approach it is just taking some of these uh, you know, complex ideas and just simplifying them, to, to teaching people some basic terms mm -hmm. from which to orient themselves. And what you're talking about is just realizing uh, that we all have a normalcy bias. Uh, other. And once you start realizing that, you can, you, then you can begin a process of uh, you know, self-analysis and... Uh, and sharing sources and, and, and looking into whether or not what you've taken for granted is actually based on, you know, valid evidence or reflects, you know, the cutting edge of current research and, and whatnot, because that information is now available and it's out there. Mm -hmm. More than likely what, what what the world view that we have at any given time is just a reflection of whatever authorities of authority figures we put our faith in uh, in the past or or, or arguments or you know models of the world that we have presented to us somewhere in the path that we said, yep, that's the best one I've come across, yep, that's me, I'm going for it. Um, of course, that's what our education system engineers, I mean, it, it's based on, you know, authority indoctrination, really. That's Absolutely true, yes. Um, and <clears throat> But one thing, with, 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 yeah, with regards to the first step of, of you know breaking people out of or, or getting them interested in any sort of further self-development process uh, and, and getting to grips with the world, it does seem to be a huge problem the fact that that first you have to, I mean, open your eyes to something that you may have known a long time. You just shut your eyes to the fact that that it's uh, it's getting ugly. Mm -hmm. It's uh, we are running out of well time to do things the way we have been doing it. Yes. And uh, and because we the world is now globalized to such a huge extent, I mean, you, you can't live your life uh, over-consuming in the Western world and, and claim no guilt for the people that well, slave in the third world so that we can enjoy these benefits. Well, apparently you can. I mean, well, it's what's been happening for the past uh, hundred years at least. Uh, so, mm -hmm. well, actually, we we seem to be willing to accept that on some level. It, it usually it's only when 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 it comes a little close to your own back door that people you know start to get aware of what's happening. I mean, you can see in the U.S. now they just had these demonstrations on Wall Street, uh, and you know people are taking to the streets and they've made massive arrests in the last couple of days mm -hmm. and this would have been unthinkable a few years back that people would actually demonstrate against you know brokers and bankers and stuff like this but then again if you know your history you know that's happened several times <laughs> throughout history that, that there has actually been public revolt against bankers and stuff but the point is that that's not really the main issue that's just a symptom yeah. of where we're going and most people aren't aware of that I mean they think that if we just have the correct fiscal policy or you know if, if we just make some uh, legislation that um, allows for people to have more freedom and corporations to have less control and all that like you know people like Ron Paul are actually running on stuff like that and a lot of people listen to that which is fine but the, the point is that it doesn't really solve any of the underlying problems. And this is also one of the things that the movement is trying to get people to realize that this is, some, this is an ancient process. It didn't start yesterday or even a hundred years ago. It, it has some root causes that are very fundamental for all of us. And unless and until we, we deal with those, we aren't going to change anything. I mean, you, you might have a little sway in one or another direction. Mm -hmm depending on whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever is in power, but it doesn't really basically fundamentally change anything. Okay. It's only going to self-perpetuate because it doesn't deal with the causes of the problems. So 
I mean, that would be another thing for people to, to really have to wake up to, which is difficult because, again, we're being bombarded with all kinds of information from everywhere, which rings true to us because this is how we've lived our life. We've all been brought up to understand that things work a certain way even though they might not. And we can't even imagine thinking about them differently because, you know, that would just make us outsiders or stupid or whatever notions that people have. Well, freaks. If someone <laughs> talks out of, the, out of the box, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But also, it, it, I mean, it is a, a matter of critical mass, really. I mean, uh, enough people getting interested in informing themselves, uh, having a, you know, taking a, a conscious stance towards their own information stream, that's the way I like to put it, and, um, and realizing that, uh, I mean, the, the, all these, you know, frantic catchphrases like, we are the ones we've been waiting for, I mean, the, they hold the kernel of truth in that uh, it is civic responsibility, it is, is, is what you can do, not what the, the next guy can do, certainly not what some authority figure can do. I mean, and that's again one of the the, the biggest lies uh, in our part of the world is that you sort of uh, you can inherit freedom or freedom that is, is part of society that that we and the well, society structure and the culture that we grew up in. And no, it is not. Freedom cannot be given to you. It can only be lived. It has to be lived. I would have to agree. Yes. By each generation. Yeah. Um. And all right. So so. Excellent side point. I mean, we, we seem to, to agree on a lot of topics, uh, actually. Yeah, I was just thinking, what we're, you're, you're actually, even though you don't uh, probably think so, you're actually a member of the movement, because this is exactly what the movement is about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything you just said is what the movement is about. Right. It's not about joining some flag or standing united with some cause, you know, as you have seen other movements or institutions doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually trying to gather up all that what you stand for and what many other people in different other structures stand for which is basically the same thing looking at the world in a pragmatic way and understanding your, your situation that's that's it really so <laughs> trying to get away from all that nonsense you hear about it online is really good well I'm glad to hear it I guess um, so have you come across other uh, sort of groups or factions or organizations what not brands uh, in your research and, and online conversations, uh, which you say are not officially part of the site gas movement, but also to some extent, uh, you know, with similar ideals and ambitions. Well, I would think that there are really there are many. Uh, most of most are really on the same path. I mean, there's I don't know if you're familiar with a guy called Paul Hawken, uh, who is a lecturer and. Uh, yes. Yeah, and he's he's, a, he's an activist as well. He's done a lot of uh, for the green movement, and uh, he he published a book a couple of years back uh, called Blessed Unrest, which uh, actually is a research book listing the more than one hundred and thirty thousand registered organization worldwide that has some sort of you know green or social political agenda, trying to move the world in a more sustainable, healthy direction. 130,000 across yeah. the globe, you know, everything from Greenpeace to Amnesty International to, you know, Red Cross, all of these organizations that basically have the same ideology, which is trying to create a better world mm -hmm. and trying to do it, but in isolation, you know, they're only looking at one part of the problem. So if somebody says save the trees, you know, or prevent animal cruelty, they're all really saying the same thing. They're just concentrating on one topic, mm -hmm. which is just a symptom of underlying much bigger problems. And this is what we're trying to get people to understand that, I mean, if you spend all your time in Amnesty International, you're doing really good work. It's just not very effective. It's not to be, you know, putting anyone down or say that what you're doing is not good, but if you get one political prisoner freed, in the meantime, there's another 10 that's been imprisoned. So you haven't really alleviated the problem. You've certainly done a lot for the person that got freed, just as when you, you know, make a well in an African village that makes sure that the village can survive. But at the same time, you have the, the, the desert area has increased by 60,000 square feet in, in a month. So you've depraved more people at the same time as you saved some. 
So you're really doing yourself a disservice because your energy is focused on the wrong issue. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at the whole picture. And this is the problem, I think, because people have a tendency to lull themselves into believing they're doing something, they're making a difference. And you can't argue that they are making a difference. It just doesn't have enough impact because we should be focusing on making sure that there are no political prisoners, on making sure that, you know, arable land is restored so that people can actually grow food and so on and so forth. And we have all the technical means to do that. We have all the understandings to do that. It's other stuff that stands in our way. It's our moral values, our, you know, monetary system and all these things that used to be something that created prosperity but just aren't anymore. And we have to be willing to look at those uh, ancient and outdated ways of looking at things. Exactly. And, and yeah, and it incumbent upon all of us, but also a criticism we, we received uh, some is, is that, well, it's easy enough to, to grow into these ideals when you have such a relatively privileged background and situation. Um, well, I mean, such a relatively high level of, of education, and yet within that, <laughs> we found the way uh, and the means to further educate ourselves and to realize that uh, when, you do, when you do that in a community of interest, looking out that it doesn't become an, just an echo chamber of whatever you know ideals you bandy back and forth, uh, that's so much more efficient. Um, and, 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 well, since we're in a transition period toward, toward something with better use of resources, I mean, that's that's how we do it. I mean, it's just to, to, to have to transport everyone to sit in one building to learn the same things uh, by rote, which is more, more or less still what the public education system does. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is indoctrination. And, and it, 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 it's not rocket science. I mean, look, more and more people are figuring that out. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I mean, so, so shit, I guess we could keep on agreeing for a couple of hours, but let's, uh, <laughs> yes. let's, let's, let's uh, see if we can angle a, a, you know, a ways towards something where, where we uh, can find something where we might, we might not be in perfect agreement. <laughs> probably, right. probably be a more interesting dialogue. <laughs> um, one of the criticisms I have heard uh, you know, directed at the uh, sidegeist is um, well, uh, that some members, uh, well, supporters who purport to, to be, uh, you know, pro guys and, and uh, active uh, online discussion boards and so forth and so on. Um, well, uh, and again, this is, this is what, what I've heard, but I mean, um, you get defensive when, when it comes to the, uh, the basic tenets of, uh, well, the resource-based economy. Is there any way you, you, can, you can sum that up briefly? Well, oh, wow. <laughs> I would say... There's a lot, again, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and crap going on, especially online, and, and with good reason. I mean, it's, it's not an easy concept to, to dig into if we are talking about what, what, an, what a resource-based economy actually means. I mean, it's taken Mr. Fresco the better part of 70 years to get to those conclusions that he got. He, just, he didn't just do it overnight. One of the things that's... Uh, interesting is that people tend to, once you present a concept to someone, they will immediately try to figure out what you're talking about. They actually want to know what you are trying to tell them. Mm -hmm. So their brains are trying to fit in with the patterns that they already have in their mind. And once they sort of lock onto something, they'll go, ah, so you mean this? Mm -hmm. And you go, no, wait a minute, I'm not finished. And then you explain a little more and then they go, oh, so you mean this? And you're, no wait a minute, you know, and this is one of the typical things that I've encountered when, when talking about these things with people. Also, when you see videos that people have done that are all made in very good intention, but they actually misinterpret a lot of the information because they just concentrate on one thing or they leave out so many things, leave it so much open to interpretation that, you know, people will jump to conclusions about something. So, if somebody shows some pictures of a circular city and a futuristic looking car and some of the model designs that Mr. Fresco made, which are, to, you know, from my perspective, quite naive in their, in their look, 
uh, and they look like something from out of the 50s, sci-fi magazines or stuff like that. And you just present it like that and say, look, this is the brave new world and technology is going to save us all. Then people are going to go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You know? And most people don't even say, what do you mean? They just say, you got to be kidding. And they just turn away from it. And there, there's your problem. And so you can take any isolated part um, and find ways of, un, of, of misunderstanding that or misinterpreting that. It really takes a lot of effort to go through what it actually means. I mean, the FAQ on the site alone is, is a more than 140 questions, and each of those is about, uh, you know, a letter page or two letter pages. So there's a lot of information to go through there, and we need to get away from this that'll never happen attitude into a how do you propose to do that attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to ask questions differently than from what we're used to. Instead of saying, you know what, you're a moron, you say, excuse me, can you repeat that, and can you please explain to me how that's going to be possible. Yeah. You know, people would just do that, then we would get somewhere. <laughs> so, I mean, you can go into a lot of different things that have been said about what this is about, and of course there's going to be disagreements. I mean, we're all humans, and nobody has the answer to anything. And as soon as somebody steps up and says, look, all we have to do is this, then I get skeptical. Right. Because there's no such thing. We can't do that. No, no one person can know that. What we have to do is ask the proper questions. And that's not something you just do from one day to the next. But that's where you start. So, I mean, you can draw up pretty much anything from what's uh, been said and done online. And there's an explanation for it. I can guarantee you that. All right. Um, one of the things that, that you know struck me, and I guess that... Maybe it's just taken out of context, and that's why you know I don't see how it fits into all this. But um, you know, having computers uh, help us figure out how to do things uh, better and more efficiently. Well, that's not such a foreign concept. We are living that right now. Um, having one central computer uh, for either for a region or for the whole world—that I don't get. Uh, right. I mean, there's, there's a, I think, also a little bit of a concept of misunderstanding there because the term central computer is something that was thought up quite a few years ago. Uh -huh. I mean, you wouldn't even use that term today because nothing is really centralized. It's not about centralization as such. It's about exchange of relevant information, uh -huh. meaning that wherever you are, you have to be able to access the most relevant information in any given field. And this can be done through AI computing, which is essentially uh, what we're talking about. And it's not, it's not that the computer is centralized. It's that the information is reachable from anywhere and interlinked in such a way that you have the best possible knowledge of what might the next probable be at any mm. point. Uh, so what the computer is doing, or I should say computers, because that is, you actually, we're actually looking at the development of this right now because what is known as becoming known as the cloud mm -hmm. is the new way of computing you have stuff like Dropbox for instance Apple is introducing the new iCloud system yeah. which is basically decentralizing it's actually the opposite of a centralized computer but it just spreads out and gives you access to your information where you are immediately and this is the revolution we're seeing right now so this is what it means. It means that it doesn't matter what problem you're facing, you will have access to the most relevant information because you have an informational grid that's active and alive all the time. So this is the, uh, the idea of, it's like if you, if you take a look at something like Google Earth, mm -hmm. which gives you a full 360 degree view mm -hmm. of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine an expanded version of that where you have layers of different information. So the most obvious, of course, is weather systems. You can monitor and see weather systems at all times. You could also have stuff like air traffic. So you could monitor air traffic in real time. You could have population movement, see where everybody is at the same time. 
you could have the state of the fish uh, population in certain areas of the sea. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It, only imagination can, you know, stop you right there. So it's it's not about controlling things. It's mm -hmm. about getting access to information and the most relevant information at all times. And and I mean that's uh, well, impossible to disagree with, them, of course. Um, and and one of the, the greatest problems of, of today, relatively to the future that we are speaking of, <coughs> is that, uh, well, we could be living in a world like that right now. I mean, it, it's just that some information is restricted. And well, I would say most information today is restricted because of copyrights and because of the way the market system works. I mean, if you look at uh, any university, any uh, scientific study group that are working on anything interesting, are doing so under extreme secrecy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to protect their investment because ultimately, if they don't get the money to do the research, they can't do the research. So they're dependent on fiscal means to do what they do. And of course, if you are an interest and want to pay for some research, you're going to want to have a return on your investment. That's how we live. That's how we make our money. So there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that it prevents us actually from moving forward in, in any meaningful direction because we have to protect our knowledge. The really relevant knowledge and information is being restricted from us. Mm -hmm. It's not free. It's not free for everyone. You can't know everything about uh, all that's going on in pharmaceutical development, all that's going on in agricultural development. How to make it's, a car run on water. Whatever, you know, it's restricted because there are people's lives are depending on it being restricted. Well, and this is part of well, to, to an extent, but I mean, corporations' lives are, are dependent on Yes, it. but what are corporations? They consist of employees with families. You know, if you take the, the medical institution and in medical industry, mm -hmm. there are millions of people working in there. If we found a cure for all the diseases tomorrow, all those people would be out of work. Yep. What would they do with their lives? Where would they go for a new job to get a new... You see, there's a paradox there that we rarely talk about, rarely think about. At the same time, we are seeing uh, um, jobs are being lost and not coming back due to the technical uh, evolution. And it's that's not going to change. We are going to see less and less need for humans as workers. That's just the nature of things. Yeah, so, 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 so how, how we... we but the funny thing is that most narratives of you know postmodern myths that are spun about that uh, I mean, somehow play to 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 the surplus of humanity as, as useless eaters. I mean, how, and, and that's well, that's so dystopic and, and so wrong, obviously. But but fair enough that that we we, we need less workers, or we we all need to work less. How is that a bad thing? I mean, how, how does that not free up more more of our time to finally get to live more? I mean, transition toward a more sustainable way of living, uh, you know, a more sensible way of using resources. Um, so that, however many of us there are, it's, it's fair enough. We have to work only a little. Excellent. We have more time to live. Um, yes, I mean, you you are right, but the problem is that that. That's not how the market system works. We can't do that because we have to perpetually keep exchanging money and because all money is created out of debt, well, which has to be... In the current fiat system, yeah. Yes, yes, but this is the problem, you know, that it, it's accelerating to the point where it really becomes completely unsustainable because the whole system needs workers, it needs jobs to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, it it has to fundamentally change uh, in order to not do that, yes. and there is no signs of anyone trying to do that <laughs> as we speak. So everybody is talking about growth, and what is growth? I mean, uh, nobody thinks about in, uh, in a bucket. <laughs> well, it, it's worked for a while, and that's why they keep talking about it. It has actually produced. Uh, a, an increase in living standards and so on, which is a consequence of uh, abundance within the system up until a certain degree. And what we're seeing now is we're running out of some of those vital resources that we need to keep growing, uh, or we need to equal growth to prosperity. And the problem is that growth no longer equals prosperity. We just need to grow to simply grow. 
Well, Otherwise, the economy collapses. Yeah, that that yeah, exactly. That's become the the reigning dogma. And and but but part of being you know born into a privileged middle class in a Western society. I mean, we, we, you and I could probably go on about uh, how being born in, in Denmark at this particular age is, is like the the the, the womb of, of of safety still. Uh, with regards to almost any other country you can name and speak, I mean, think of. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to me, that that's it, it's a huge privilege, but but uh, an equally great responsibility. And I guess that's why we're having this conversation and do what we do. Um, but uh, did I lose the thread there? Uh, in lauding Denmark. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, but uh, what was the go from that? All right. Um, well, I think what you're trying to say is that being privileged as we are is really difficult to uh, to think in that way because we we you have to have the problems close to heart before you really realize the depth. Of them. And I'm not sure if I'm putting words words in your mouth, but was well, that close to uh, what you? Well, to, to an extent, uh, though actually, uh, well, well, no, I mean. Uh, that's one way of, of looking at it. I mean, if you're poor, I mean, you 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 you're hungry, and then you find some some way of leaving it. In that's a decision, a decision, well, situation if you can. I mean, you 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 only sit around in your ass if there's absolutely nothing you can do. And you're in the middle of the desert. You either die or or get some emergency aid. Um, no, it, it's well having this the perspective of a uh, well peace. Uh, behind us for, for the last, say, 60 years here in Denmark. Um, and probably also the country that was the least devastated by the Second World War uh, of, all of all of Europe. Uh, we collaborated with the Wehrmacht, so that's what we did, basically. And then later on, we were allowed to tell a, a story of resistance. I mean, there were some resistance movements, but, but you know, they, they didn't define the time. We just told that myth afterwards. Now we can see from this uh, vantage point, from this perspective, and I guess you and I also agree there, that just growth, just material, uh, technical growth, that's not development, in, not, mm-hmm. not in itself. It's, and it's not you know, a necessary part of an evolutionary process. Uh, it's been a, I mean, the rate at which te- new technology is invented and implemented, even in this world of restricted technologies, is mind-boggling. It just goes faster and faster and faster. Mm-hmm. And what lacks behind it is the, the evolution of philosophy to, to go with it. Uh, how do we use all these new toys or tools sensibly, reasonably? And perhaps even sustainably someday. Right, uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's all it's been termed cultural lag. Mm-hmm. That have, uh, it takes a while for culture to fall in line with the uh, technological change. I mean, there are some great examples throughout history. Uh, you know, of once the refrigerator was invented, mm-hmm. people used to have ice boxes in their homes, and uh, so there were many people protesting against you know getting a refrigerator. Because they liked, you know, the ice man that came by and, and delivered the ice. Yeah. <laughs> of course, eventually, it just made so much more sense to have a refrigerator that people sort of caved in and, and got a refrigerator instead. Because it was just obvious that it was much, much better and it was much easier and much more hygienic and all these things. Uh, and you have that with every piece of new technology. There's always resistance to that because the culture is used to something different. You even have it with with you know cultures like the Amish who uh, who really resent modern technology and they still use candles they pretty much live as they did in the mid mid 18th century but again you know even on the carriages horse and buggy carriages they now have electrical lights because it's just much more practical mm-hmm. and they they are also forced to have number plates on their on their trucks and stuff you know even though they're horse driven and ah. they have to sort of, they have to adapt to those times, and even though it takes a while, mm-hmm. and I would say the biggest challenge is for us to to get detached from our traditionalized uh, cultural values mm-hmm. that actually hold us back. 
because even though it's romantic and we like those things because our brain likes, you know, familiarity and systems and stuff like that, it's actually become a really big hindrance for us uh, because we have such a linear way of thinking um, that we have a hard time catching up uh, culturally to the technological development. Yeah. So no more ever before than now has it been really important for us to catch up because the rate of technological development, as you mentioned, is really rapidly increasing and it looks very much uh, on many levels to be exponential. And most people really have a very bad grasp of what exponential growth actually means. Yeah. It's very, very different than, than linear growth and it has, it's, a, it's a very difficult concept mm -hmm. for our brain to grasp. But we have to because we're going to be overtaken completely because our culture is so far behind mm -hmm. the actual things. True, I mean, and, and of course that could uh, again lead to one to, to dystopic thoughts that it's like, ah, this is impossible, we, we, we cannot get to grips with this, I mean, uh, we're too far down, down the line, so forth and so on. See, that's the interesting thing. I mean, um, there may be, uh, say, a, a tipping point, um, and, and, you know, We've heard that again and again and again, just like we, we have throughout history, uh, you know, each time has its own major global crisis, at least with regards to the last 50 years. I mean, what, what have we had, uh, you know, Second World War, Cold War, threat of nuclear war, mm -hmm. um, global climate change, uh, and, and now, I mean, the apparently never-ending, uh, increasingly worsening global financial crisis. Uh, I mean, to my mind, it's just, it has become obvious how th these are myths, if you will, that, that are, are played out in the public scene, that are, you know, through repetition, 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 put into to people's minds so that there's a, a baseline of fear, mm -hmm. which, you know, Paralyzes and numbs into apathy and, and yeah yeah yeah. There's nothing I can do to change the world anyway. Pass a beer. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, and well, then they are there. I mean, though. Uh, but would you agree though that uh, I mean, Sidegas being one really well known and and, and fairly uh, you know international speaking fairly popular example. But you mentioned also I mean the blessed unrest and and this thing. All these, you know, institutes and groups. Mm -hmm. there, there, there seems to be a lot of, of credibility to the fact uh, to the, there being some sort of global awakening, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that people coming from different lives, backgrounds, perspectives, parts of the world are just not buying into the the old dogma anymore and are, are trying to find and fit new versions, new visions together. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, I think it's becoming abundantly clear that a number of people, a growing number of people, and a rapidly growing number of people really want to do something different. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole point is, what, what do we re replace it with? And, and most people, you know, have different ideas mm -hmm. of how to do that and how to do this. And it's usually based on some form of ideology, which is fine. I mean, that's we come together in groups and we form ideas and we reinforce those ideas. And you have people like the permaculture uh, parts that, you know, they go out in some rural part of, of uh, the country and they set up a small village and they grow all their own vegetables and it's all sustainable and nice and everybody's happy. And that's fine, but the problem is what do you do when the rest of the world collapses and everybody comes running for food? then then you your little small fine rural community is going to be ravaged mm -hmm. you know uh, you have to take everything into account you cannot isolate yourself there's nowhere to run anymore we cannot keep perpetuating these ancient ways of doing things and we have to stop thinking in terms of nations and groups of differential people that just doesn't work anymore it doesn't serve us anymore you might argue that it has actually served us throughout our evolution, but we are at a point now mm -hmm. where it doesn't make any sense to talk about Denmark or the U.S. or whatever you want to talk about as some sort of isolated entity that can live 
isolated from everywhere else. It just doesn't work. We live on a planet and it doesn't care where we put up our artificial borders, whether they're physical or philosophical or religious or whatever you want to call that. We have to get past that and try to understand that if we don't work together, regardless of what we think, we're not going to be here in a very short time. So it's really that it's that serious and we have to try to get some, somehow mm -hmm. to get people to work together. The good thing is, the good part is that there are a lot of people already halfway there. They ha already have the intention to do something mm -hmm. on different levels and if we can get those people to work together so that you have all different experts in different fields starting to communicating, not caring about whether or not mm -hmm. the information makes them money or whatever, but actually starting working together that way across borders, across nationalities, mm -hmm. pretty much like the space program, you know. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic example. You have the, uh, the International Space Station, which is actually like 10, 15, 20 countries, uh, and sometimes even more, mm -hmm. working in collaboration, sharing information, because if one of them fails, they die. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, they, there's no second chance there. Right. No. In, in space die if you fuck up. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very good example that shows that people can overcome their differences and actually work together to create something instead of destroying things. Exactly. And another, uh, to, to my mind, extremely relevant example is just the, the phenomenon of open source development. I mean, starting with, with IT products and, and where we are today, I mean, where you know, many open source developed products have you know, are better than and are used much more than, uh, well, commercial uh, equivalents. Uh, I forget, it was two or three months ago I read that the Putin insisted that the entire Russian, you know, official bureaucracy switched to Linux. Um, mm -hmm. That's an interesting move. I mean, probably, in, you know, an extension of, of moving away from the petrodollar. Uh, <laughs> and I would be, be completely done with the US now. <laughs> yeah. Nothing from it, <laughs> um, but uh, that mentality uh, that that sort of, sort of beautifully encapsulated within you know just programmers just to contributing code to to open source uh, development. Uh, if you can get that sort of just that simple, you know, uh, economy of generosity, you can almost call it uh, that, that sort of thinking into other areas of, of business and, and and start working from that. Uh, just again, what we're trying to, we're trying to do is a <laughs> extremely small scale, uh, uh, you know, example. But but just seeing if we can get a startup up and running. Uh, but but I mean, do, doing things uh, we call getting people, but doing things in the way that 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 will fit into an uh, economy of generosity, uh, mm -hmm. and and eschewing um, all the standard business moves that belongs within the economy of greed. Just to see if it's possible, uh, we'll see how far we can go. Um, and uh, yeah, another. I mean, that that's a pretty well, other good examples out there. Uh, Stefan Molyneux, a Canadian philosopher. You, uh, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah. And you, you you learn from the internet, I guess. You you know of Stefan. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the way he does it, it is is very beautiful example. Um, and well, of course, I'm not sure how great a living he would make if he didn't have his. Uh, <clears throat> really successful psychologist's wife, but, but ah, you're getting somewhere now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean, the, his intention uh, is, is so so obvious, and uh, and, and well, and, uh, I root for him in, in, in the sense that he uh, he does not compromise. I mean, he he practices what he preaches. Yes, I mean, I and I totally condone that a hundred percent. I think we need more people like him. Uh, to do what he does, uh, and there are several examples of, of people like that. The problem is, um, as you mentioned, uh, well, or actually didn't mention, but I was hoping you were getting to, right. is that the problem with open source uh, is that it's it's counter to, to, to the way business works. I mean, you have to be able to make money uh, mm -hmm. in this economy, so even even if the open source model actually works better in terms of creating or fulfilling people's actual needs, which is there's abundant evi evidence of that. I mean, Wikipedia is another great example, especially if you pin it against uh, the Encarta, uh, which Microsoft, you know, spent trillions of dollars trying to get up and running, and 
And lo and behold, uh, you forgot about it, haven't you? <laughs> there, there was something yeah, called definitely. Inkata. Tr trillions, are you sure? I mean, I <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know I, I know, but I mean, it's, it's, it's like the only, it's the only amount you can measure dollars in these days, right? <laughs> yeah, it's something, yeah, it's, it's hopeless, really. But anyway, you know, they, 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 you know, they hired all the right people. They did all the right things in a business sense. And still, they were completely outcompeted by uh, this open source competitor, mm -hmm. uh, which came sort of out of nowhere. Uh, and because people volunteered their time and their interest, I mean, of course, there's a lot of crap on Wiki as well. But uh, if you look at it, some of the articles are extremely well uh, mm -hmm. built, and you know, there's so much enthusiasm about that project. That uh, that actually most of the most of the uh, information is more relevant than you'd find in any other paid for dictionary, uh, and there are many examples of this. And the problem is that it's counter to the business model that keeps the world running. Mm -hmm. So it has a limitation because people naturally have to do other things; they have to work to to make a living. But it's just interesting, and it goes to show that we all have an intrinsic uh, urge to contribute. That's what we do. We want to learn things. We want to be part of things. Okay. And we, we do that even without monetary incentive. You know, that's mm -hmm. a secondary thing, really, in, in our nature. So we can easily provide all we need without even thinking about money if we look at it from a, from a you know, pragmatic human standpoint. We don't really need money mm -hmm. if we can find some alternative way of administrating things. So money is a secondary thing. And there's actually been several scientific studies showing that money can even be actually a, a hindrance mm -hmm. for development especially when it comes to critical thinking and problem solving whereas it's very effective for rudimentary tasks, repetitive yeah. tasks and stuff like also, that. So the creativity, money is a really poor motivator for, for creative thoughts. Exactly, yeah, there's, there's ample evidence of that. So anyone who, who argues that if people don't have a monetary incentive to just lie around the couch all day and do nothing, that's just bullshit. There's no scientific merit to, to warrant that anywhere. So, But of course it's what we've been used to, so everybody thinks it cannot be anywhere else, which is, which is bull. Well, yeah, um, but, but again, that, that's where I guess people like you and I can become frustrated with everyone so once in a while. Uh, once you realize this, one, once you've been, been getting access to, to someone, anyone who can explain it to you in a, in a way that makes sense to you, and there's so many people out there doing it for free, right? Uh, that's, everyone is becoming a YouTuber anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and once you realize it, it is so obvious. Um, but uh, you started out saying that you, you were a concerned citizen and then you came across the, the sidecast movement. Can, mm -hmm. can you remember before you started realizing these things, uh, you know, before, say, scales dropped from your eyes, whatever kind of metaphor you want to use? Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you still remember what that was like? Sure. I mean, uh, one thing I can remember is that I, I've always had a problem with money. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't explain exactly why, but I always thought that there was something wrong with this money thing. I couldn't explain to you what it was, mm -hmm. but to me it was, it was counterintuitive that the same product could have different prices. I didn't understand how that value was put on it mm -hmm. and that something was worth, let's say, $100 one day and the next day it was only worth $50. I mean, what was that all about? And even though I understand the mechanisms, of course, of the so-called free market system and all that, and I can see that it's all demand and supply and all those things, there were still some things that just didn't ring true. I couldn't understand how that came to be. And I just, like everybody else, I just said, oh, well, you know, that's just how it is, and it's development, and we used to trade things and do barter, and then it's just much easier to, to have tokens that we can exchange. And I, I bought into that whole story uh, that I was taught at school, of course. And, uh, you know, when you're a young kid, you get your first, you know, piggy bank, and you go to the bank and have your first bank account, and it's, it's made into some sort of event, you know, and people are you know, opening a savings account on your behalf and grandmother puts in you know whatever each month and all these things and it's kind of romanticized in that way and you know we have to save up for a rainy day and you know, all these things and and it just takes away this whole really false dichotomy that exists around these things that you know we're actually we when people talk about human rights it always it makes me kind of laugh because 
You cannot talk about human rights and demand of people that they provide for themselves in order to survive at the expense of other people. I think that's just hilarious. But I'm getting off on a tangent here. Uh, I've always had this feeling that something wasn't right, and I couldn't explain it, or, and I didn't think too much about it, but right. as a result, I've always been really bad with money because I, didn't, I couldn't put a value on my own work in terms of money. So I've always sold myself too cheaply, even though I'm really good at what I do, mm -hmm. and I know that, and I have no problem with that. I still always undercharge because I I feel bad at charging people, and it's just it's always been with me for some reason. So when I came across uh, Mr. Fresco and just listened to him very coherently explain how we got <laughs> to where we are, mm -hmm. it was like everything just fell into place. It really snapped together as to how we have this system we have is directly an outgrowth of scarcity and without scarcity there's no need for money and it really is that simple it's not simple to create abundance but the concept of it is simple right. if 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 you have if you have abundance of any product it's not worth anything in a monetary sense mm -hmm. so and then it becomes interesting with what creates values what creates um, needs versus wants and this is not an easy discussion absolutely not it shouldn't be taken lightly and you cannot just say well if we just uh, eliminate scarcity altogether there's going to be no problems uh, I don't uh, let, 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 uh, can I hold you that thought of scarcity for a minute please? Yeah. so one of the things that, that uh, to, to my honest, uh, current understanding uh, is well scarcity yeah but, but uh, well, a much bigger problem is, is the artificial scarcity uh, that you know, certain interest groups are, are able to engineer and, and, and maintain. Uh, at least they have been. Like you know, we, we hear, you hear people, some people talking about the all the, the secret oil reserves uh, reservoirs uh, beneath the well, United States or the area that we now call the United States. That you know they just won't let them tap into uh, because then they would have no reason to go to war and have that huge military industrial complex. Uh, so you need to have the artificial scarcity of, of crude oil in order to run the, the engine of empire. Um, and but, but well, we, we're, what, we're approaching 7 billion, is it? I mean, again, population expansion mm -hmm. go so incredibly fast. Sometimes, it, isn't it just hard to, uh, well, why does the, the world population keep growing at this point? It's, it's strange. Um, but not really. No. Well, <laughs> no. Okay. Because it's exponential, like everything else. Ah, right. So, yeah. so I mean, and that's that's where it becomes hard to grasp. I mean, it's it's an interest. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, you, but sure. that was a really really sharp point right there. And I think. At, uh, are you familiar with Chris Martinson? No, I haven't, I haven't heard him yet. No. Uh, um, go to uh, chrismartinson.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's he's got uh, he's developed what he calls the crash course, yeah. which is a twenty chapter uh, online course of the what he calls the three E's: mm -hmm. the economy, the uh, environment, and the uh, uh, energy. And those uh, three E's are the problems right now. And he's he's compiled a huge amount of very very thorough thoroughly researched information mm -hmm. that really just presents where we are and what needs to happen if we're to avoid any kind of collapse. And one of his main points is exponential growth. And he has a very good way of explaining how exponential growth actually functions. And then he lists all of the graphs over the last hundred years that clearly indicate a very, very detrimental exponential growth which we have to deal with within the next twenty years. And his tagline is, the next 20 years are going to be much different than the past 20 years. And I advise anyone to go on to chrismartinson.com and check out the crash course because it's really important information. And whether you support one group or another group, or doesn't matter, just check that out because it's very anti-political. It's, it's no political agenda. There's no agenda as such. He's just presenting this data in a very coherent way. I'll so I, do that. Yeah. yeah, I recommend anyone to do that because... That's one of the things, you know, how come this you know, exponential growth in population? Uh, and he has a very good way of explaining that.
And the same thing goes for our money expansion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's going to get out of hand, and it's going to get out of hand very soon. And nobody seems to realize this. Um, but we all owe, we already owe ourselves ten times the amount of money we actually have, yeah. globally speaking. So it's completely insane. What is a credit card? I mean, it's, it's a you know fiat currency generator. I mean, every time you use it, you generate new debt. Uh, Absolutely, it's, I mean, it's directly food out of Absolutely. your grand, grand grandchildren's mouth that we're yanking. So. Exactly. Yes. Uh, But which is also, you know, can for many people a fairly uncomfortable truth to come to terms with. So, so much easier to deny it while it's still can, I guess, for some. Uh, one thing I, I, I promised myself I would ask, and now I've skipped many of my questions because we've answered them in our ramblings. <laughs> um, yeah, well, anyone still around to listen well, to them? Well, 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 You know, we'll we'll post uh, as we always do. We'll post the the whole tape, but but uh, cut out the good parts. And so, right, good. Um, all right, well, cut out the good parts and put them in our current format. So, well, only you know, huge nerds or people who know us personally probably would watch the whole thing. Um, how so, since you say you're taking a step back from being coordinator of the uh, site guys for Denmark, um, this this whole sort of process of, of Discovery for you and, and and you know, getting uh, knowledge and, and skills and, and tools and understanding and a network that can help uh, you know further your concerned citizenship. Um, I mean, it's well, contractual history is, is always difficult. But how would any of the work you you've been been doing it would have, would have been it would have been different uh, if you hadn't been promoting, say, the sidecast movement or. If you've just been doing it, you know Stephen King uh, here, get responsible. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that there's, and I guess this is true for everyone. There's a turning point where, where you know, where where stuff just clicks in a certain way, mm-hmm. um, and this is where you have to be wary of, you know, falling into some trap where you where you start believing in, in some truth, mm-hmm. uh, and there's many people. And I hate to say it, but there really there are many people who call themselves zeitgeisters who really don't get it. I mean, they think they get it, but and they're also misrepresenting the movement in many ways because they're 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 making assumptions that that just aren't there or aren't true because they come from that same frame of mind. Uh, and this is unfortunate, but what are you going to do? I mean, we're human, and we, it's difficult, and you have to. When 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 you get to this point, you have to you know really think hard about your own values and where you come from and where you're going. This is not easy for people to do. And I had a realization at one point where where I thought to myself, I might actually lose some friends over this, mm-hmm. and I might actually lose some parts of myself that I that I didn't think I was going to lose. Because once you say A, you also have to say B. Once you go down the path of new understandings, there might be something that scares you and there might be something that is counter to what you used to believe. Mm-hmm. And giving yourself, really giving yourself permission to to take that in and try to step back far enough to understand whether whether or not it's relevant is a, is a huge step for most people to do. And I know it was for me. Uh, so I don't think I would have gotten to this point where I'm where I'm now if I hadn't run into, I would say Actually, movement or no movement, but just uh, just meeting Jack Fresco has been really, really life altering for me. Just spending a week with that guy, mm-hmm. I mean, because he has such a, a different way of looking at things and such a a very, very pragmatic way of explaining things that takes you a very long time to understand what he's actually saying. And the first time he says something, you go. What was that? He didn't. He didn't answer the question. He was like, you know, a completely different place. And then you think about it and you say, no, actually, he was answering the question. He was just answering it from the right perspective. Mm-hmm. So you were actually expecting something different because of your own limitations and values. And realizing that is a huge step. It was a huge step for me. Not particularly because of, of Fresco, but because it makes me analyze things in a very different way now you know when people say something uh-huh. I analyze it in a very different way or when I'm presented with information I analyze it in a very different way because I always have to try to sift through 
what is actually the agenda behind this? Who made it? Why did they make it? What is their stand on things? And this makes it sometimes very frustrating mm -hmm. and very time consuming, but at the same time it also develops your, your critical thinking and your way of relating to things and your bullshit detector gets sharpened. Um, we all need so, those. <laughs> yes, we all really, we really need those. So I don't think I would have gotten there without uh, meeting him. Right. Uh, absolutely. Not to say that he's the end-all be-all because he certainly isn't. I mean, he's also just a human and, you know, late developments have sadly shown this as well. He's, he's uh, publicly more, more or less denounced the movement as the advocate arm which is stupid and nonsensical and it's really difficult to explain why uh, other than he's, you know, he's getting old and his life is running out and he's probably worried, you know, and so he's human. He has emotions like everyone else and, and we all have shortcomings. Uh, but if we don't see past that and stop focusing on what he said, she said, <laughs> we don't have a chance. I mean, we have to get past that stuff. I could not agree more. Um, and I think um, 